Hello and welcome to the symposium. My name is Carl and I'm going to be talking about the kind of person who would sit under the sword of Damocles. I always wondered about this. So to explain what the sword of Damocles is, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. In the 5th century BC, the Persian Empire invaded Greece, and after the Greeks repulsed the Persians, after the Persians burned down Athens as revenge for the Athenians starting civil war in Sardis, the Greek world found itself militarized and polarized between the democratic powers located in Athens and her empire and the traditional oligarchic rule of Sparta. Neither one is something we could call tyranny in the in the original Greek sense of the word because this is a slightly separate issue. Tyranny is not done generally by kings and is not the these are not the people we call tyrants. Uh, Tyrants are men who seem to essentially employ a body of foreign mercenaries and take over a city and tyrannize it, frankly. It's just autocratic, uh, one-man rule, and none of these tyrants have been remembered favorably. Uh, Syracuse in Sicily, a Greek city in the Greek diaspora, sort of outside of the mainland in, in this era, was the most powerful city in the West, uh, the Greek city in the West, and a place of great experiment, it seems, when it comes to these kind of political arrangements. But it had many, many tyrants, such as people like Agathocles, who warred with Carthage, the great empire of the West, or the, from North Africa. And one of the thing that, things that we, we learn about the... The, the the price of being a tyrant is that it was not a, a secure life. It was not a life that most people would choose. The The story of the Sword of Damocles, isn't Damocles such a great name? It sounds powerful and imposing, but Damocles wasn't the person in, the important person in the story. He was actually just the foil. Uh, the the man we're seeing with the beard there, who's clearly making some kind of point, is a man called Dionysus II, and he's a tyrant of Syracuse. He took over the tyranny of Syracuse when he was quite young, because his father, Dionysus I, died when he was in his 20s. Now, Dionysus I was apparently a very effective tyrant. Now, that's bad for everyone who's being tyrannized, but it's good for the tyrant's record in the history books on paper afterwards. It makes him look like he's successful and competent, and it really under, uh, belies the kind of human suffering that they created in their mission to make themselves the most pampered person in the city. And in, in Dionysus the uh, example, a miniature empire that he creates across Sicily and Italy. He has a has an army of mercenaries with which he oppresses the city. He gained these by faking an attempt on his own life and having 600 bodyguards assigned to him. Mercenary bodyguards. Uh, Salerioi, I think it was pronounced. Um, we're not entirely sure where they're from, but they're Italian mercenaries, which is not an unusual thing for this time period because there are mercenaries everywhere after the Peloponnesian War. And Dionysus uh, begins his rule just after the end of it. And so the, there are lots of armed men who are looking for employment, and he's one of these employers. But he, he ends up tyrannizing and raping and pillaging a small empire for himself. And he mysteriously dies young. And then his son takes over. And his son, I mean, the, at least Dionysus I, you could characterize as a competent tyrant. He knew how to keep himself secure, not make too many enemies and thoroughly defeat the ones that he had. But Dionysus II was not the man his father was. And he ends up getting ousted from the, uh, the tyranny of Syracuse twice in his life. And he ends up being the tyrant of the Locris as well at some point, which is another Sicilian Greek city. Uh, and it, it's bizarre how they're friendly to him and he decides he's going to tyrannize them anyway because I suppose he can't give up his lavish lifestyle. But this is what we're told about uh, Dionysus II and his interaction with a courtier called Damocles. Now, this is just an anecdote, but there is an underlying truth to it that I think that it is, impo that it is important to remember. I mean, as they say here, 
The anecdote is often told as a reminder that for a powerful man there is always danger, although the real point of the story is that happiness is fragile, but that's uh, part of his wider Tusculan disputations. But the, the particular anecdote here is, Indeed, this tyrant himself gave his judgment as to how fortunate he was, for when one of his flatterers, Damocles, mentioned in conversation that the wealth of Dionysus, the majesty of his rule, the abundance of his possessions, and the magnificence of his royal palace, and denied that there had ever been anyone more fortunate, he said, So, Damocles, since this life delights you, do you wish to taste it yourself and make trial of my fortune? When Damocles said that he did desire this, Dionysus, uh, Dionysus sorry, gave orders that the man be placed on a golden couch covered with the most splendid, uh, most beautiful rug, embroidered with splendid works, adorned with many sideboards and chased with, with chased silver and gold. Then he gave orders that chosen boys of outstanding beauty should stand by his table and that they, watching for a sign from Damocles, should attentively wait on him. There were unguents and garlands, perfumes were burning, tables were piled up with the most select foods. Damocles seemed to himself fortunate. And compare it to the rest of a, an ancient or medieval city, I think modern people forget just how much these things would have smelled, like animals and animal dung and butchers and just lots and lots of very base smells come out of an ancient city. And so this is why they... Uh, pour ungulants on themselves and burn perfumes in order to make themselves feel clean and to make everything smell nice for once because back then most things didn't smell nice most things were actually kind of gross i mean some settlements didn't have any any sewer uh, any sewage uh, waste disposal so you would have just cesspits and they wonder, well, they didn't. They, we know why the disease outbreaks were so frequent, but they obviously didn't. But anyway, in the middle of this luxury, Dionysus ordered that a shining sword fastened from the ceiling by a horsehair be let down so that it hung over the neck of that fortunate man. And so he looked at neither those handsome waiters nor at the silver work, nor did he stretch his hand to the table. Now the very wreaths slipped off. Finally, he begged the tyrant that he should be allowed to depart because he no longer wanted to be fortunate. That's good, isn't it? I don't want this fortune, because this fortune comes at too high a price. Because the tyrant, and not just the tyrant, the person at the top, never knows when forces have colluded outside of their, outside of their view in order to bring down a deadly weapon upon their head. You don't know when the horsehair is going to break, but you do think that at some point that horsehair is probably going to break. And as is the same for people who are ruling illegitimately over people, which is what tyrants indeed were doing. And the thing that's most interesting about this is the person doing it. His father was, uh, like I said, a great tyrant who ravaged Sicily and Italy. And oppressed many many people and was in the end possibly poisoned by his own son so it's not surprising that damocles uh, that dionysus dionysus the second will have learned this very lesson from the example of his own father it makes you wonder what damocles has learned from all of this because as cicero points out it might look wonderful and attractive but one of the things that the the cicero is pointing out here is that look when when you are con constantly in threat of danger like this you cannot just enjoy the riches and wealth and luxury that you have it's not as fulfilling as you might think it is it would be better to live a life that was not as opulent not as luxurious and not fraught with this kind of danger than it would be to live for a small period of time under the mercy of the integrity of the horsehair until one day, of course, it finally breaks and then comes down and kills you. It's not just a commentary on the danger of autocracy or high office even. It's a commentary on the kind of person who would choose to go there and do that. Why do you need to assert so much power over others? in order to, in, to, to live in luxury and wealth and not have peace and harmony. 
Things that you can't enjoy because you don't have peace of mind. What kind of person would do that? 